The world is plagued by wars, rumors of wars and revolution almost everywhere this weekend. The Christian Science Monitor reports this past week that revolution is spreading through Africa. In India, hundreds of people were killed this past week as Hindus and Muslims fought each other. In the Middle East, the Arab-Israeli conflict grows hotter as Israel invaded Lebanon. While President Nixon has definitely promised that all American troops will be out of Cambodia within the next six weeks, the casualty figures this past week were the highest in months in the Southeast Asian War. But the greatest and most significant war of all for Americans was being fought on the campuses and in the streets of the United States. Not since the Civil War has there been so much disruption, unrest, and violence in America. The television screens and the newscasts on radio and the columns in the newspapers are filled with statements of gloom, pessimism by our leaders. Some leaders are flatly stating that we're in the midst of a revolution. Some Christian leaders are saying this is the beginning of the judgment of God upon America for her many sins. Other Christian leaders are saying that perhaps the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the earth and lawlessness and rebellion is going to spread worldwide as we approach the end of the age. Educators who were so smug and complacent in their ivory towers until about two years ago are watching some of our higher educational systems being destroyed by a tyrannical minority whose idealism has extended to guns, firebombs, riots, vicious arrogance, and instant gratification. Many people have told me this past week they never dreamed they would see all of this in America. Our newspapers are filled with reports of wave upon wave of violence across the nation. Some of our outstanding colleges and universities are being torn down by a minority of students bent on destruction of anything that represents authority. I'm convinced after meeting with students at scores of universities across the nation that the overwhelming majority of American students are responsible citizens wanting a serious education. However, they are being denied that education because a minority of radical students are forcing confrontations with school administrations. While the Cambodian invasion was the excuse, and spring fever certainly has contributed, the real causes and grievances go far deeper. Most educators and student leaders are saying that if there had been no Cambodia, the schools would have erupted sooner or later anyway. In many places, the Cambodian issue is almost forgotten as other issues have come to the front. Most of the American people have watched in fear and revulsion as mob psychology has taken over many of the campuses of the country. They've watched a relative handful of radicals and revolutionaries bring America almost to the brink of revolution. Many of these student radicals revel in violent confrontation for its own sake. The causes and objectives of the movement take second place to the rebellion itself. The object of the revolutionaries is a wedge to drive into society's vulnerable cracks and eventually to engineer the downfall of the entire nation into anarchy. I've asked some of these revolutionaries to provide an alternative to the American system. What would they put in place of the present system? They become confused and are not able to give constructive or logical answers. Many of them like violence just for violence sake. Man has always been violent. Ever since the time that Cain killed Abel, man has lived in a period of violence, and violence is spreading today. Now I believe that there's room in every college and university in America for student participation, for open dialogue and genuine discussion, but I do not believe there should be room for disruption and violence. Charles Dickens, in his famous book, A Tale of Two Cities, writing at the time of the revolution in France, said, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, but it was also the age of foolishness. There seems to be a parallel between the words of Dickens and what we see taking place in America today. In many respects, it is the best of times. America has unparalleled prosperity. The human and economic resources are beyond measure. We're the most technologically advanced nation in the world. 
We have more freedoms than perhaps any nation in the world. Our freedoms have almost become license. We've taken advantage of our freedoms. Religiously, more people go to church in America than possibly any country in the world. Independent evangelical religious groups are flourishing throughout the country, even though the established churches are declining. There's never been such a hearing for the gospel as we have at this moment. Thousands of people are being converted to Christ from coast to coast every week. This next Friday night, we begin a crusade at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in a great stadium that seats more than 60,000 people. And it's our prayer that hundreds and thousands of people during the next few weeks are going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But as Dickens said, it is not only the best of times, but it is also the worst of times. The President of the United States said two weeks ago that we live in an age of anarchy. He said mindless attacks are being made on all the great institutions that have been created by free civilizations in the past 500 years. He said great universities are being systematically destroyed before our very eyes. Did we ever think that a president of the United States would have to say that? Except perhaps Lincoln during the Civil War. I believe that young people have a right to question. Youth should carefully question the dogmas and the values and the institutions of their elders. They're totally justified in examining the gap that exists between what their elders say and what they do. They have better informed minds than my generation had. They're more idealistic. They're far more aware. They have a deeper concern for their fellow man. And the youth of America find trouble at home and in the world, and they're all ready to leap on white charges and set off to do something about it. Sometimes they're not sure what, but they're bent on action in some way. The older generation should have no quarrel with young people who have taken up the cause for a better society. This is not only their right, it is their duty. But if they engage in violence, burning, looting, brick throwing, then they're wrong. The right to reform does not mean the right for violent revolt. Not in a lawful society that is based firmly on the foundations of law. Some young people are going about trying to change societies like butchers with a meat axe. I do not believe that we can secure peace through violence or peace through rioting and wanton destruction of public and private property. You cannot attain morality through immorality. Jesus said, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You could paraphrase that and say, whatever a generation sows, that shall it also reap. Violence and disorder bring on more violence. Immorality makes a society sick to the core. A society without government and law is a jungle in which only the strong will survive. Some of the young people have succumbed to their own zeal. The scriptures in Proverbs 12:15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. For such people the prophet Isaiah said, None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their mind. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Wasting and destruction are in their paths, and the way of peace they know not. Isaiah said that in the 59th chapter of Isaiah. Hawthorne once wrote, Zealots have no idol to which they consecrate themselves high priest, and they deem it holy work to offer sacrifice of what is most precious. So would the youthful high priest of today sacrifice the American system that gave them all the freedoms and the advantages and the educational opportunities that they have. They would destroy education. They would destroy the Supreme Court. They would destroy the presidency. They would destroy the Congress. They would tear down respect for law. Some would even tear down the church. Many of them scorn the God of our fathers. Thus they lay these time-honored treasures at the feet of the graven image of social revolution built upon lawlessness, destruction, and anarchy. I would like to make two things clear today. First, the vast majority of American young people, both black and white, may disagree with the system. 
but they believe in working within the system to bring about social change peacefully. The second thing I would like to make clear is that many changes are needed in American society. The home, which is the basic unit of society, does need changing. Prayer, Bible reading, and grace at the table, and discipline are needed to come back into the home. The young people need to see honesty, firmness, integrity, and love in their parents. The college and university system of America does need to change. Many of them have lost touch with the reality. They've been teaching that academic freedom means freedom to do as you please. The ultimate situations that young people face, such as suffering, death, and religious faith, are not given the priority on campus that they should be. Every man is a trinity. He has a mind that needs educating. He has a body that needs development. But he also has a spirit that needs God. Our educational system has almost totally disregarded this great need of man. In that sense, I agree with the young people. Our educational system has become almost totally secular, humanistic, and in some instances, even Marxist. However, I cannot point a finger at the home and the school and the government without saying that the church also desperately needs renewal and revival. A United States senator said this past week that the church seemingly can no longer distinguish for its followers the differences between morality and immorality. Bob Dylan used to sing a song, Blowing in the Wind. Certainly the church of the living God needs to feel the fire and the wind of the Spirit today. Black and white Christians need to lift the torch of faith high at this hour. This could be the finest hour for the church in American history. We're the ones that have the message of peace, hope, and faith. We're the ones to whom are committed the gospel of Jesus Christ that can transform and change the individual and can make its impact upon society. And we in the church need a renewal of faith that could match Abraham when the scripture says, by faith, Abraham went out not knowing whither he went. When the mysterious voice of God summoned Abraham to start his caravan over a road that he had never journeyed before, he must have started out with the same uncertain feelings that grip millions today. No word in the entire English language is more vital and essential than this word faith for the Christian at this hour. Too many of our leaders are saying to have faith in ourselves or faith in our system. No, my ultimate faith is not in the American system. My ultimate faith is not in any system of government. My ultimate faith is not in the United Nations. My ultimate faith is in the kingdom of God. And over that kingdom presides the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not an ambassador of the United States. I am an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And it would be just as cold-hearted and brutal to shout have faith to a drowning man who cannot swim a stroke or to radio a passenger in a jet airliner that's about to crash, have faith in yourself. It would be just as brutal as for me to say to you today, have faith in yourself. I say have faith in God. Have faith in Christ. Put your confidence in Him. He will never change. He will never fail you. Our need today is for faith in God. While the world has changed radically since Abraham's day, yet we can have faith in the same God who guided him when he went out, not knowing whither he went. The kind of faith that Abraham had is exactly the same kind of faith that you must have. There are scores of passages that the Christian can take for comfort at this hour. In Exodus 33:14, the scripture says, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, the scripture says, He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. In Isaiah 41, 10, the scripture says, Fear thou not. For I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We as Christians have the pledge from God himself in a thousand passages that he loves us, that he will guide, guard, and protect us. But to you that do not know Jesus Christ and cannot put your trust and your faith in him, it is to you that I address myself now. What are you going to do at this hour? What are you going to do when the judgment of God falls? What are you going to do when God shakes the whole earth? What are you going to hold on to? 
What are you doing now? There's a shaking in your home. There's trouble in your heart and in your life. Your life is all mixed up. Why don't you turn by faith to Christ today? Repent of your sins and receive him as your Lord and your Savior. You can do it right where you are. Right now, riding in an automobile. Listening late at night beside your set somewhere out in the ocean on an ocean liner. Wherever you may be, you can say yes to Christ. I received a letter some time ago from an airplane pilot. He was flying his airplane and he was listening to the hour of decision as he was crossing the North Atlantic. And while listening to the hour of decision, he made his commitment to Jesus Christ. That could happen to you right now, wherever you are. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, at this turbulent period of history, we thank Thee that we can have faith in Thee and that we can put our faith in Thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have our sins forgiven and know that we're going to heaven. We belong to another kingdom. We belong to the kingdom of heaven, which is going to live for tens of thousands of years on through eternity. We thank Thee and praise Thee for the hope that Thou hast given us. For we ask it in His name, Amen.